Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian McCollum, and as usual I have a whole slew of questions here from those of you who are signed up to support Forgotten Weapons directly on Patreon. A big thanks to all of you guys, you are the reason that Forgotten Weapons continues to exist, continues to publish videos every single day. So let's get right into these. Our first question is from Matthias says, Hi, having shot and gotten a close look at a Stoner 63, do you think the platform or the concept, the modular receiver, deserves more R&D? Regards from Sweden. Honestly, no. Um, the more experience I get and the more guns I look at, the more skeptical I get about modularity in general. Because while it's cool and it's a neat engineering feat, like it required the amount of skill and dedication and, and and knowledge that went into creating the Stoner 63 system is phenomenal. I think even among the people who who think the Stoner is incredibly cool, even among those people, I think there's if anything an underappreciation for how much engineering finesse went into making that gun what it is. It's really kind of mind-boggling that Stoner was able to do everything with that system that it does. So I don't want to take away from the the skill that went into it, but at the same time I don't know that there's really that much purpose for it. Um, because when you make a modular gun like that you're always going to be making uh, you're going to be making concessions on things, you're going to be making compromises. All gun designs are compromises to begin with, but a modular gun design is even more compromises. Because you're trying to make one part not just do its one function at the best balance of things like weight and durability, now you're trying to get parts like the receiver to do to, to balance in multiple functions at the same time. Like how do we make this an ideal rifle receiver and an ideal medium machine gun receiver at the same time? And I think you will inevitably end up with guns that aren't, well obviously they're not going to be as good uh, at being each one of those different things as a dedicated gun for each purpose would be. And I just don't think that the logistical benefits justify it. Uh, the idea of having three guns, like let's let's just say the US right now, we have the, the M16 or M4 pattern rifles, we have the M249 as a belt-fed 5.56, and then we have the M240 as a belt-fed 308. Trying, I think, if you try to combine all those three into one gun like the stoner, I don't think the logistical benefits of doing that outweigh the downsides that you have, namely things like the rifle is going to tend to be too heavy, where the 308 machine gun is going to be too light. I don't think the modularity is really worth it. It's a very interesting point to me, and it's really kind of a, a fundamental philosophical question. Like, should we be doing with the royal we, are you better off doing modular guns or doing purpose-built guns? And I'm kind of swaying myself towards purpose-built. Next question is from Kiwi Comanche, who asks, Why haven't you been on Instagram for so long? You are missed. Well I apologize, I started up the Instagram page hoping that I could make it work, and it turns out I just do not have the time available in the day. So if we could come up with a way for there to be like 30 hours in a day, or perhaps like 9 days in a week, then I could probably get more stuff, maintain a presence on more platforms like Instagram. But short of that, which I don't see happening anytime soon, um, this operation pretty much just is me, and I do not have the time to be posting cool stuff on Instagram, as well as Facebook and Patreon and YouTube and everything else. So I'm sticking to the ones that, um, honestly, I'm kind of sticking to the ones I'm most familiar with. So I do have a, a reasonably active Facebook page. Um, I do have some behind the scenes stuff that I put on Patreon uh, for the folks at the $3 level. I figured that was a a cool place that the people who are willing to support me to that level I think it's fun to be able to provide back with a little bit of extra interesting content. So if I had extra time Instagram would be the next place that I would go to, uh, but I just don't. Actually I should mention I think there, not I think, there is actually a fairly active uh, subreddit as well, r slash forgotten weapons, and I do poke my head in there every few days and, and occasionally comment on things when, when I can and when there are things that uh, really seem to need a comment. So sorry, uh, Instagram is probably not going to happen anytime soon. 
Next up is from Franklin, who says, Do you believe the French were too quick to adopt the Lebel? It's my understanding they had just purchased an updated Kropacek rifle, which would have served them decently if they'd taken time to perfect a new rifle design. Considering that within a few years we saw guns like the SMLE and the Gewehr 88, it seems like the French, well, the magazine, Lee Enfield, he says, my mistake, uh, it seems the French would have been better off designing something similar to those rifles instead of trying to get a smokeless powder design a couple of years before the other countries. Franklin, I believe you are exactly completely correct. Uh, the French were too, too rushed in developing and adopting the Lebel, and to be fair to the French Ordnance Department, the, the arsenals that were doing this development, uh, they actually were not too fast at it. They were going through the process of due diligence and designing the best rifle they could to really exploit this fundamental new powder. They did have time to do that with the cartridge, uh, well, with part of the cartridge, with the bullet. So they spent like a year deciding on exactly what type of bullet they wanted to use, and that's where they ended up with the 8mm. The problem is about the time they got that figured out, and by the way also jacket components, things like that, to withstand this, you know, basically close to double the velocity that people were typically used to using with, with plain lead bullets. Anyway, about the time they got that done, a new Minister of War was appointed in France, General Boulanger, and he wanted something done now, and he gave the, the army, the ordnance, the, uh, the armories, about six months to have a finished new rifle on his desk. And it is that point that they basically took the Kropacek and said six months is just an impossible timeline to develop anything new. We will take this, the best thing that we have now, and we will adapt it to smokeless powder. They adapted it to, they created the 8 Label cartridge by necking down the, the 11 millimeter Gras cartridge that the Kropaceks used. They adapted the gun to use it, new barrel, new chamber, some tweaks to the magazine system, and boom, there's the Label, there's the new rifle. Prior to that they had actually been looking at both the Monlicker system with the packet loading and block clips. They had also been looking at Lee, um, I believe the Remington Lee in particular, but uh, the new, this cool new concept of the detachable box magazine. And they, in my opinion, and yours, they absolutely should have, Boulanger was wrong. They should have taken a couple more years, because within a few years of the French introducing the Lebel, everybody had smokeless powder. Uh, and they would have been much better off developing a, a proper top-of-the-line rifle to go with their top-of-the-line cartridge. If they had done that, um, they wouldn't have needed, basically they, they might not have needed to develop the, the Berthier. Uh, honestly, they maybe could have gotten away with having a rifle that would serve in the place of the Moss 36 all the way through the end of World War II, basically like Mauser did. You know, the, the Mauser system, the bolt-action Mauser system, dates to in its earliest forms the late 1880s, and it served quite effectively through the end of World War II and even longer in many smaller countries. So, you know, the perfected Mauser was 1898, ten years after the Lebel, but uh, give the Lebel a couple years and it could have been a far better system. Oops, lessons for the future there. David says, do you read the comments on YouTube? Yes, and that's why I have a therapist. No, actually I don't have a therapist, but maybe I should, given that I read all the comments on YouTube. Um, so from the creator side, as a channel owner, I have a function that is a, a basically up to the moment stream of comments on all videos that I have published. So some people occasionally comment, like I'll, re I'll respond to something on an old video and someone will be like, wow I didn't have any idea you'd still be reading comments on a video that's two years old. Well. Comments actually appear for me in when they're when they're written. So I see comments on today's video at the same time I see comments on anything else, any comments that are written today. And I do read them, not necessarily all of them, but I try to check them once or twice a day. And I, I respond to some. I try to respond to the ones that really would benefit from a response. But at the same time, reading YouTube comments is kind of a, well, is literally a morass at best. Uh, I am generally inundated there with um, pop culture and video game references, um, memes, you know, text versions of memes, because thank goodness you can't post images in YouTube comments. Um, and I have been more than once tempted to just shut them off, looking at them and going, you know what, is this really a valid use of my time? Should I be spending an hour a day reading through all of this? And I never 
quite bring myself to do it because every so often I get a YouTube comment that is legitimately very valuable. Um, most often it seems they are comments from uh, non-American military vets who have experience in the field with some of the guns that I've done videos on. And it's, oh, I find it really interesting to hear from people who had first-hand experience with, you know, like an Argentine FN-49 or a Spanish Setme L. What were these like in the field? If I made some assumptions about how the guns worked, or if I had some hearsay back here in the US, I really like finding out, was that legitimate, or was I mistaken? Was there this some interesting thing that I wasn't otherwise aware of? So those, there's just enough of those comments that I'm never willing to completely shut down the feed, which honestly might free up enough time for me to do Instagram every day. But uh, So yes, I do read the comments. No one else should read the comments. You should never ever read comments on YouTube videos, because they're one of the lowest forms of discourse in human social existence. Uh, next up is from Garrett, who said, Have you ever thought about branching out to show evolution of other items besides firearms, like first aid kits, web gear from different eras and countries? Kind of, sort of, but not really. Every time it'll occasionally occur to me if I find some particularly interesting piece of kit. But then ultimately I realize that I don't really have the, the, the contextual knowledge to know, like, I could very easily put up some neat piece of kit, and it turns out it's the 87th iteration of this idea that's been common practice somewhere since, you know, the 1850s, and I just didn't know about all those others, because while I like to play with some of this sort of stuff, some of the other military gear, I do not in any way have the, the depth of background knowledge on it that I do on the firearms. So every once in a while you may see something like that show up. It's actually more likely to show up on in-range TV. That's um, the, the channel that I co-host with Carl Casarda. We do kind of more modern-ish, more practical-oriented stuff, and that's where um, material like interesting and unusual gear and ancillary equipment would show up. Uh, Stelios is actually kind of exactly the sort of person I was just talking about a moment ago. Uh, he is, you know, uh, was in the Greek military and said he was issued at various times both an FN, FAL, and also a G3. And is asking about, uh, he says, both guns were issued to us with standard bipods. My feeling was that they improved accuracy but were tactically cumbersome. Do you think that bipods provide an advantage for a soldier or a hindrance? And do you think the same holds true in a conscript versus a professional army? I think it's a very interesting question. And I am actually interested to hear, uh, I, I would be very interested to hear opinions on this from other people who have actual combat experience, or at least military service experience. Um, because I do not. My opinion is that the bipods are indeed a valuable thing, um, in a couple of different ways. So a lot of the 762 millimeter, like Cold War era, what a lot of people would call battle rifles, had integral bipods. Guns like the G3, the FNFAL, um, some iterations of the AR-10 had them, uh, the Beretta BM-59 had them, and these are also guns, these are guns that are in 7.62 NATO, so full caliber, full size cartridge, and were select fire. Uh, the M14, there was a version of the M14, the M15 with a bipod, or the M14E2. Uh, and in that, at, at, given that type of firearm, the bipod kind of allows the gun to take on a pseudo light machine gun role. Not, certainly not an apt, uh, a good substitute for a light machine gun. But if you have a couple of guys, if you need uh, suppressing fire on a position, and you have a couple of guys who can switch the guns from semi to full, drop down on bipods, those bipods make the full auto fire far more useful and controllable and practical. And I think they are well suited to that role. There is then also, uh, and, and by the way, a lot of those bipods were mounted directly to barrels. And so if you start putting weight on them, you can very easily deflect your point of aim substantially. I've seen as much as a foot difference in point of impact at, say, 100 yards, depending, you know, from putting a lot of pressure on a bipod versus none. So that's not necessarily, that where that's good for sustained full auto fire or suppressive full auto fire, it can be a problem to try and use that for very accurate single semi-auto shots. There are other, a few guns, not very many, but there are a few guns that have free-floating built-in bipods. And of course, predictably, my example of this is going to be the French FAMAS. 
And I think that's a really handy thing to have on the gun. Now my experience comes from range shooting and competition. We try to make it as practical of a type of competition as possible, but it ultimately is not real combat experience. And so I'm certainly willing to hold open the possibility that my experience there is not representative of, of a true military environment. To me, a free-floated bipod on a rifle, as long as it's not particularly heavy or bulky or clumsy, is a very useful tool to have. Um, even if it, you know, it doesn't have to be the typical sort of, you know, there's a guy I want to get one really precise shot, so I'll flip open the bipod and go prone. It can be things as simple as, you know, you're in urban combat in Fallujah, and your job is to provide overwatch for the rest of the squad as they go down a series of buildings. So they put you up on the roof, and it's a lot easier, in from my understanding and experience, a lot easier to maintain concentration on what you're doing, on observing for targets, if you've got the gun sitting on a bipod at a continuous ready, instead of having to hold it up yourself, and maybe jiggle it around between some sort of ad hoc support positions. So. I like the idea of a bipod, and I think a lot of the ones that are built into current military rifles are not particularly clumsy or awkward. Um, in fact, the FAL, the G3, the FAMAS, all those bipods to me are pretty clean and, uh, and handy. So if you are uh, a person with some relatively substantial experience in the area, I would indeed be very curious to hear your opinions on that same question. Uh, next up from Nathan. What are your recommendations for the best firearms museums in the US? I would say two. Uh, one of them is the NRA Museum in Virginia, or in Maryland. It's in Maryland. It's just outside of DC. Uh, it has a tremendous number of guns on display, which is what I would want in a firearms museum. There are actually, while there are a, quite a lot of military museums out there, there are relatively few firearms museums. And there's a big difference, especially given today's um, today's trend in museum design to have fewer and fewer actual objects on display, and instead to create kind of an immersive story experience about whatever event the museum is themed on. Um, as a firearms guy, I really prefer, if I'm looking at a military or firearms museum, I would like to see as many artifacts on display as can possibly be crammed into the available space. So the NRA Museum uh, certainly fulfills that, and the other is the Cody Firearms Museum out on the opposite end of the country in Wyoming. Um, same sort of thing. Uh, they also have a tremendous number of guns on display, including a lot, in both cases, a lot of rare and unusual and unique ones. And if you are ever in a position, if, if you're watching a video like this, it is absolutely worth your time if you ever have the opportunity to visit one or both of those museums. Uh, Tyler says, I've been wondering about this for a long time. How exactly does a gun designer know the sizes of the various working parts in the gun? For example, how wide or how long to make a gas piston, or how far does it need to cycle back? I'm also wondering about springs. How do they know what size or strength to put in? The size of locking lugs, or even how far the piston has to push to allow for proper cycling? Uh, there are a couple different answers to that, depending on what time frame you're giving it. Uh, today, a lot of that is done through mathematical computer-aided design systems, where uh, basically a, a computer-aided drafting program has a physics engine built into it. And you can simulate, like you can say, here's my barrel, chamber, gas port, gas piston, here are all the dimensions and all the weights and the materials of these and their material properties, and if I simulate a 55,000 psi explosion here in the chamber, and the gas port's this far away, what's the pressure here, What? how much velocity does that impart to a gas piston that is this size and weighs this much? Um, and that has, in many ways, dramatically simplified the work of designing this sort of thing. Now if you're talking about 50 or 100 years ago, I think this is a lot of where design expertise comes in. And certainly still today, knowing approximately what you want to have those, where you want to have all of those dimensions and measurements makes a big difference. That's what that's what differentiates a, an engineering, a graduate engineer, from someone with experience in firearms design. And a hundred years ago that was that much more important. A guy like Browning had done so much experimentation that he just kind of knew, you know, rule of thumb. And you'll find that in every professional field. Like if you're going to talk to a plumber and, you know, I want to design the plumbing for this house. Well, how, you know, I've got I've got the, the main line that goes to the sewer, and then I've got 
some lines to toilets, and some lines to showers, and bathtubs, and sinks, and some of them are right next to you know the edge of the house where the line leaves, and some are on the far end of the house. How big do the pipes need to be? How deep do they need to be to avoid freezing in the winter? Uh, do they even need, you know, do we even care if it's a you know, just a sewer line instead of an incoming pressurized water line. What slope do I need to these pipes? That's an area where experience, and in the case of plumbing, reference manuals, well, comes into play. Like, you do enough of it, you just know, oh, you know, we've got this much distance, and this is a relatively slow draining item, so we need this much slope to it. Same thing with firearms design. Uh, and in the old days you would then, and still today, you, you kind of, you, you come up with an initial design, and then build one, and trial and error it from there often. Uh, now even a long time ago they did have effective forms of high-speed photography. Often this could take the form of something like uh, drill a hole in a part, and shine a bright light through it. And so as the part moves, the light moves on, on your backdrop. And then your backdrop is, say, uh, film. And you have it connected to a motor, and you're spinning, you know, you're, you're winding this long reel of film while you're doing the test fire of the gun, and you know exactly how fast the film is moving. And you say, trigger this with a, an electrical connection that is a wire across the muzzle of the gun. So when you fire a bullet, the bullet breaks the wire, that triggers the camera to start. And then you don't get like a visible video picture of what happens, but instead what you can do is then go back and look at the film and say, ah, I can trace the plot of that, that bright light shining through the hole in my bolt carrier, and thus I know exactly what position it was in at a given time. And I can tell, was it moving too fast? Was it moving too slow? They had uh, tools like that to help uh, figure out the, the details of the engineering process. So we tend to think of a lot of this stuff as, well, you can only do that with an electronic camera, and you know that sort of circuitry didn't exist all that long ago. But no, they've had ways to do that, clever ways that give you the diagnostic elements you need, if not a nice YouTube-ready video. So yeah, long experience, trial and error, and today, computer-aided drafting and design. Uh, next up is from Michael, who says, when it comes to buying ammo, do you shop locally or online? Uh, and if you buy online, do you have a favorite supplier? If you have a favorite supplier, do you have a promotional deal with them? And if not, why not? Well, I can answer that whole train of questions. Uh, I typically buy ammo online because the shops around me don't generally stock it in real bulk. You know, if I'm gonna, if I'm, I'm in a position where if I'm gonna buy ammo, I'm gonna buy it by like the thousand round case because I, you know, I know I'm gonna use it. So why buy a box or two at a time? Um, Local shops generally don't carry a, but just a bunch of cases of stuff. They are more oriented towards selling a box or two at a time, and they're more expensive. Um, it's just the truth of the matter that they're paying for a lot of employee time and lighting and you know retail property, and they have expenses that an online retailer doesn't. So I can get a better deal online. Um, I do have my favorite, maybe I have a, a retailer that I have kind of gotten into using because. They tend to have prices that, if not quite the best, are always very close to the best. Often they are the best. And they have a really good selection of the ammo that I'm looking for, which sometimes is common stuff like 5.56 and 9mm, and sometimes it's weird stuff. These guys are one of the most reliable sources I have for 8mm Lebelle, um, and that is SG Ammo. Their website is sgammo.com. Now I do not have any sort of promotional arrangement with them. I have actually tried on a number of different occasions to set up some sort of promotional arrangement for ammo suppliers with Forgotten Weapons, both as a video channel and just the website before I even really had a video channel. And I found basically the answer why I don't is that ammo has a very limited margin, and there just isn't a lot of space uh, in the budget for an ammo dealer to make some sort of uh, you know profit sharing sort of deal with someone like me. They're they just they don't have the profit margin to do it. And a lot of these guys, a lot of the companies that I've talked to, um, in fact I've I worked with Fioki for a little while. Uh, those of you who've been on the website for a long time may remember seeing Fioki banners there. I have tried to work with PPU, or Pervy Partisan, these guys. Um, those are the two companies that I am primarily dependent on for weird ammo. Fioki makes a lot of cool obsolete pistol ammo. 
Pervy Partisan makes a lot of cool obsolete rifle ammo. They're like the only people out there making 8mm Lebel in any sort of scale. And I'd love to have some sort of deal with them, but um, Fiocchi was very difficult to deal with and just lost interest, and PPU has never been interested. They just don't care, and they're not looking for more advertising. So um, SG Ammo, I've brought it up occasionally, but they, they're not really interested. So okay. Um, when, I, when someone asks me in a context like this, I will absolutely happily call out SG Ammo. They've always shipped fast, they ship well, I've never had problems with them, their customer support's good, not that I've ever had to return anything or really needed it, uh, but their responsiveness is good and their prices are good, so that's who I use. Next up, let's see, is Pete. How long do you think you will be able to keep doing Forgotten Weapons in its current format before running out of eligible weapons to film? If your answer isn't forever, do you have any kind of exit strategy for the channel? Uh, hopefully a change of format rather than closure, when the time comes. At this point, years. Definitely at least five years I think I have. There, there are enough guns out there to do. Um, they will get, over time, a little more difficult to source. And what I, I have a couple of plans in mind. One of them is, is kind of something that I've been doing a little bit already, and that is to branch out a bit into less forgotten weapons. I think there is absolutely value in, in fact it's essential, to in order to properly understand the guns that are popular today, you have to understand the ones that aren't popular. Because often these are sorts of things that we're in competition with each other. Like, why do we have the AK? Well, part of the understanding of why we have the AK has to be rooted in what did it do better than the other guns that were available at the time? And so for that reason, of course, we want to look at the weird prototypes, which I haven't had a chance to because I haven't ever been to those museums in Russia. But um, as, as it gets harder to find some of those weird prototypes, I think it's worth coming back around and looking at the common guns. So you'll see those periodically. I did one on the Mini-14 recently, or, or one aspect of the Mini-14 for part of that reason. Now, that being said, if if it gets hard enough that I just don't have enough material to continue the publishing schedule that I have, what I would, I think, enjoy doing is reducing the uh, the video publication rate to potentially even just one video a week, but doing much more in-depth videos on them. Um, I'm not, not copying what CN Arsenal does, but getting, to my mind, what I would want to do is videos that touch a lot more on the practical handling and use of the firearms. So to me it would be interesting to be able to have enough time to do something like, let's take a couple of Mos Nagants into a really cold environment and experiment with them for a while and see, like, is the, for example, is the Mosin better than the Mauser in a really cold environment like the Eastern Front uh, during the winter? Um, taking historic machine guns, and and spending the time to properly get them tuned in. You know, these guns are 100 years old. They virtually always require a, a, a non-trivial amount of work to get them running properly, like they would have when they were brand new. And that's something that I don't really have the ability to do on the publication schedule that I have now. So I can show you the disassembly, I can talk about the mechanics, I can talk about the history. But being able to actually get out there and show them to you and develop that first-hand knowledge that you can only get through reasonably extensive use of the gun is something that I can't really do right now, and that I would like to. So if it comes time that I can't maintain a video every day, that's what I would like to sort of shift the channel into. But whether that happens in one year, or three years, or ten years, I have no idea. And I'm not in a rush to do it either. Next question is from uh, Chris. Uh, Chris says, how much of a threat were Lee Enfields and most Nagants in Afghanistan? Did the Soviets or Americans ever consider going back to full power rifles to counter this? Not that much of a threat. Um, I think there's a misunderstanding of those guns and their use in Afghanistan. Those guns, so <laughs> the, the tribes that have always been fighting against foreign occupiers in Afghanistan have always, have never had indigenous weapons that were anywhere near as good as what the invaders had. So um, in our context we can take this back to the British invasions of Afghanistan when they're basically fighting against Jezails and other muzzleloaders. Well, when Afghans were able to capture British Enfield rifles, those things were worlds better than what they currently had. 
And so those became very prized rifles. And, you know, the guys who had them were much more effective than the guys who were still out there muzzle-loading, you know, weird off-diameter gisales. That same thing comes back when the Russians invade. Now the hot gun to have is an AK-74, and those guns supplanted Lee Enfields as quickly as they were able to be captured. And there's this mythology out there of the, you know, the like the elderly Afghan fighter with tons of combat experience who's got his Lee Enfield and he's absolutely deadly with it. It's sort of this idea of beware the man with one gun because he probably knows how to use it really well. There is some truth to that, however, as far as I've been able to tell, there wasn't really much motivation among Afghans to keep those Lee Enfields. Like if you took that guy and offered him an AK-74, he would be very happy to take it. And then the same thing has kind of happened again with the American invasion, um, to the extent that ammunition is available and, and such. But I think really the big effect was the Enfields got replaced by AKs, because the AK was a much more suitable practical gun. Now did the US or the Russians, we'll focus on the Russians here, ever need to consider going back up to a full power cartridge to deal with this? No, because they had Draganovs in 762 by 54 rimmed as their standard marksman's rifle at that time anyway. So they already had those guns. There was no, no reason that they would consider re-equipping the entire military with, at that point it would have been like, let's go dig out the SVT-40s or invent something entirely new. No, there was no need for that. No. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Chris has a second question, which is, why do we never see anyone on YouTube with a Vickers K gun? That is because there are very few Vickers K guns in the United States. Um, that is basically the Vickers gun, but air-cooled and with a pan or box, but typically pan magazine on them. The most common place you will see those is on Long Range Desert Group, the LRDG SAS Jeeps in North Africa. Those guys often used Vickers K guns. Those guns were most commonly used as observers guns in like interwar aircraft. Um, they're just, they didn't make all that many of them in the first place, period, and there are very few of them in the US, and so it's hard to find them. Next question is from Phoenix, who says, more along the lines of your cocktail connoisseurship, but, has, uh, but everyone has a drink that they abstain from or a drink that doesn't agree with them. For me, it's tequila. What is the drink or liqueur or liquor that you don't typically touch? I don't have, you know, typically that story is, you know, someone had a bad experience. Sorry about my phone going off there. Typically someone had a bad experience with something, usually at a party in college, and the mere sight of it makes them nauseous to this very day. I don't have any experience like that. I was a pretty boring person in college. Um, and so I, I don't have anything that I abstain from entirely. Uh, the things that don't just really appeal to me that much are actually beer. I'm not a big fan of, of hops, um, and so a lot of beer just doesn't appeal to me. And I'm also not a huge fan of anise or black licorice flavor. So things like um, absinthe, ouzo, eh, I, it's not that like I have any anything specifically against them, they're just not my taste. Uh, Mike says, I have noticed that in some of your distinctive trips like Malta, Denmark, and Switzerland, uh, you have videos that are posted months apart. How do you choose the order in which the videos are posted? I don't really have any hard and fast rule. Um, what I try to do is spread them out. I, I may have learned from the Bergman debacle years ago that inundating you guys with too much identical content all at the same time isn't the best course of action. So, and often a trip that I take like that will have a lot of content of a similar theme. Because whatever I have access to in a particular foreign country, I'll try and cover like whatever special there that I can't get back in the US. That's something I try to focus on covering. South Africa is a perfect example. Um, in fact, almost my entire trip to South Africa consisted of filming South African and Rhodesian guns. And I don't want to just dump, you know, a month of nothing but South African guns. So what I try and do is balance them out. If anything, I will kind of default to having one video per week from any given trip. So there will be times when you'll find, you know, when I'm plotting out a month of scheduling, I'll be like, okay, you know, Monday will be South Africa, Wednesday will be Malta, and Friday will be a video from Europe. Sorry again about my phone. Uh, and then I try and balance the, the type of guns. So we've got some things that are 
you know, really obscure collector niche items. And we've got some things that are more well-known popular items, like a lot of the stuff I filmed at HK falls into the, the well-known popular theme. Um, and I try to balance those out as well. I don't want to inundate the channel with all popular, you know, video game connected guns. And I also don't want to overwhelm it with things that most people aren't, aren't going to be interested in. So variety in all things would be my general guiding principle. Parker asks, has there been any weapon you thought would be really cool, but once you got your hands on it was actually not uh, interesting or unique and didn't turn into a video? Not, well, so in some ways, yes, all the time. Like when I go to visit one of the auction houses, what I have going in is generally a, an Excel spreadsheet of what guns are going to be in that auction. But that has fairly limited information, you know, fairly limited details, and it has no pictures. So it's not uncommon at all for me to say, ah, you know, here's this interesting Mauser variant, for example. I'll plan on doing a video on that one, and when I get there I discover it's been sporterized, perhaps. Or it isn't quite the variant that I thought, or it's just not a good example. Maybe it's in really rough condition, too rough for me to want to actually put that one on camera. And so then I'll scrap that and, and not do a video on it, planning to later, eventually, when I do find a good example of that gun, I'll do a video then. On a, I think more to the point of what you were getting at, Parker, the best example I can think of of a gun whose reality was completely different than my expectation uh, would be the Johnson light machine gun. I had a chance to shoot one of those, and I was expecting this to be like a really cool, really good light machine gun. You know, it's it's light enough to be nice and portable, it's a, it's lighter than the BAR, it's got a good magazine, you know, good capacity magazine, it's got a bipod on it, it's got a good pistol grip. This ought to be a great gun. On paper, looks like a great gun. Turns out it's miserable to shoot. That thing recoils way more than you would anticipate. And it's interesting that I have found the same thing when I, I had a chance to shoot a semi-auto drawer, not full auto, but semi, and the drawer is just a, a, a variation, basically, an, an iteration on the Johnson. That thing, even in semi-auto, was a beast to shoot. Um, that left me with red marks on my shoulder, matching the shape of the butt plate. And then I've I've made a habit ever since of ta whenever I run into someone who has a Johnson light machine gun, I ask them about it, and the response has universally been, "Yeah, those things are really unpleasant to shoot." So I still plan to do a video on one. Um, the one time I had a chance to shoot one wasn't something I had an opportunity to be filming. Uh, but that is a gun that I, I did not anticipate the reality of that gun. Uh, Eric says, what guns, if any, are on your must-have list to complete your collection of French weapons? Um, it's getting kind of down to some of the pretty unique and weird and like really hard to find stuff. So first one that comes to mind is an FRF2. Uh, the almost current. I think they're in the process of replacing it right now. Bolt action sniper rifle. That's going to be an extremely difficult weapon to get, but who knows? You know, all things maybe are possible. Um, I have one good example of the French Kropacheks. There are four different variations of them. The, uh, the 1878, the 1884, the 1885, and the 1874 85. And I have a really nice 18, uh, 1878. In fact, it will be in my book. I have a pretty mediocre 1884, and I would really like to get good examples of those latter three French Kropacheks. They're extremely rare here in the US. Eventually those are possible, but it'll take some time to find them. Um, beyond that, some really, really niche variations. Like I'd love to have a Remington made 0715 Berthier that was actually, actually taken into service by the French military. Those are very, very scarce and a few other things like that. Uh, but it's getting pretty close to having like a complete collection of French rifles, which is really cool. Uh, ben says, as someone who shoots far more than most of us get the chance to, which may actually not be the case, uh, have you ever been concerned about lead exposure? Do you take any precautions or follow any post-range routines? And have you ever had your lead levels checked by a doctor? That is a very good question. Um, so first off, I do, I, I do more shooting than the average person, but I probably don't do quite as much shooting as a lot of people think, because frankly I'm spending most of my time traveling and filming videos. You'll notice most of my videos don't have shooting. Um, I wish I was able to do more shooting than I currently do. Now 
as for avoiding lead contamination in the first place, what shooting I do is almost exclusively at outdoor ranges, and that goes a very long way to mitigating that risk. The biggest place that you have lead exposure is in an indoor range where you have bullets impacting a backstop and then having aerated lead basically getting into the air supply and, and inhaling it. And that's obviously a big problem, and that's a, a major maintenance issue for indoor ranges. Well, I don't like indoor ranges for a lot of reasons, the noise, the congestion, the exposure to lead being a smaller, but still one of those factors. So by shooting outside I avoid a lot of the issue. I habitually, I will always wash my hands between shooting and eating anything. That goes a long way. Um, I don't do any of my own hand loading. And if you hand load, especially hand loading unjacketed soft lead bullets, you're going to be at a much greater risk for lead exposure that way. I did have my lead levels checked, but it was a while ago. It wasn't an issue at the time, and I haven't changed any major practices since then, so I haven't had them checked in a while. Uh, if you shoot a lot at an indoor range, if you shoot a lot with unjacketed lead, that is definitely something that you ought to think about. Um, not saying you need to do anything specific to prevent it, but definitely think about that, because lead lead is a bad thing to get in your blood, as Flint, Michigan has taught us. Uh, let's see, next up, Brett. Uh, why 9 by 19 millimeter? What led to the 9 millimeter becoming such a universal round even prior to World War II? It seems odd that a cartridge used by the bad guys stayed popular after World War I. That cartridge was used by a lot of people. Um, and the 9 millimeter, 9 by 19 parabellum was one of the best cartridge pre, you know, the best early semi-automatic pistol pre-World War I cartridges. It was one of the most powerful, it was one of the most efficient. If you compare it to something like 9 by 23 it gets more energy in a shorter case. Um, the design worked well, it's a rimless case. A lot of those early cartridges were semi-rimmed, things like the 9 millimeter Browning semi-rimmed, that turned out to not be a great design concept and didn't stick around very long. Uh, it has just enough taper to be reliable, but not so much taper that it causes problems in magazines. It's just a really well put together cartridge, and it was available in some of the best pistols, well the best pistol available before uh, World War I, which would be the Luger. Um, obviously 1911 is a popular gun, but it was not nearly as prolific on the international, on the world market, as the Luger was. The Luger was the gun to have. Uh, prior, you know, 1900 to 1910. Um, and so it's not really surprising to me that it stuck around. It was also uh, a cartridge that, that integrated well into submachine guns, which helped to keep it popular. The 45 ACP, for example, you start losing magazine capacity, which wasn't that big a deal for early pistols, but it was for early submachine guns. Um, it's just a really efficient good cartridge, and that's why it stuck around so long, um, despite being used by the quote-unquote bad guys. Uh, Moose Mamer <laughs> says, in honor of the G11 video, do you think there could ever be a resurgence of interest in caseless ammunition for an aircraft gun? Cooling would be less of an issue given high altitude and airspeed and some other things, and the answer is no, uh, because there will never be a, uh, a resurgence of interest in guns on aircraft. Maybe on helicopters in in the form of, of cannons, but on on actual like combat aircraft, fighter aircraft, jets, no, um, because the opponents are moving far too fast and are far too far away for guns to be a good option. Uh, missiles are are the technology going forward, and they will not be replaced by guns. So, would something like the A10 benefit from a caseless shell? Maybe. Um, if anyone is ever able to properly develop caseless ammunition for small arms, then maybe the, I'm sure there will be some interest in it in larger calibers. I'm dubious that it would ever actually make any significant impact in an aviation related um, setting. About halfway through here. Next question is from Andrew. 
who is also asking this question again. If the Mini 14 had been made 10 years earlier, do you think that its similarity in aesthetics and function to the M14 would have given it an advantage over the M16 or AR if they were competing against each other for military adoption during the Vietnam era? I am sad to say that it probably would have. Um, it certainly would have would have been a point to the M Mini 14's benefit. Would it have been enough to actually edge it out over the Armalite? I hope not. I think history has shown us pretty conclusively that the AR, the AR, the M16, is the better design system. I would certainly prefer it over the Mini 14, but given what we do know about some of the people involved in the US procurement process, very possible that, that you know, familiarity and it's a, uh, there probably would have been something to the effect of like, we can make some of the parts on the tooling from the M14, despite the fact that that never works out. Yeah, it probably would have helped it, yeah. Uh, not for the not to the benefit of the American military, though. Uh, Keith says, if you had the money to build a collection of NFA firearms, but uh, had to limit yourself to one theme or category, what would it be? That is a pretty easy one for me. It would be light machine guns. Especially if I had to get more specific than that, it would be early light machine guns. But to me, for NFA stuff, which for those of you who aren't in the US, that basically is short-barreled rifles and shotguns, silencers, and machine guns. The most interesting of those are of course the machine guns, and the most interesting machine guns to me are rifle caliber but easily portable. So um, I owned a Vickers gun for a while and I ended up selling it when I realized I just I never take it out to the range. It is too much of a hassle, too much work, too much infrastructure to to really be worth using all that much. Mechanically, they're amazing guns. They're engineering marvels, but it's a lot of money to have invested in something that sits on the floor and you take out to shoot like once every two years. So light machine guns have the benefit of you can just like pick the thing up and put it in a car. So um, magazine fed light machine guns would be my, my ideal, like that's the niche that I would be really interested in collecting. Uh, maybe someday that'll happen. That'd be cool. But uh, <clears throat> uh, Keith points out that his would actually be basically that, or World War One heavy machine guns. And I can see World War One heavy machine guns being an awesome uh, collecting focus. It's going to take a lot more space, um, not necessarily more money than light machine guns, but more space. Uh, and man, those, so many of those are just really cool. Maxims and Schwarzlosas and the Vickers gun and the early Colt guns. That, that would be really cool too, but not quite my taste. Uh, Santa Roga says, what semi-automatic rifle, either last ditch or regular production or modern improvised, do you think would be best suited to an effort by home builders to recreate? Um, moderate tooling, lathes, small mill, uh, and purchasing pre-made barrel stock. Well, um, I would say the easiest way to approach that question would be to start by looking at what things cannot be done with basic tools in a home shop. And the things that really jump out to me there are of course stampings. You can make stampings, you can mill your own stamping dies, and presses are not that hard to get. A press is a pretty basic machine tool along with a, a lathe or a mill. But typically if you're trying to recreate a gun, the guns that have stamped parts are made for mass production. And it's going to be easier for you to mill a part than to mill a die to make a part with another tool. So I would eliminate everything that has stamped parts. I would then eliminate uh, recoil operated guns. I think those are generally going to be a little more difficult. Not necessarily, but probably. the. This is, again, again, people are going to assume this is my Francophilia coming through here, but one of the guns that occurs to me that might be a particularly good option here would be the Moss uh, 49 or 4956. It has a milled receiver. It's not exactly the world's simplest milled receiver, but it's not particularly complex. It has a very simple operating mechanism. It is true direct gas impingement, which means you don't have to build a gas system or a gas piston. You will have to drill a gas port, but that can be done. That's not that difficult. Um, it's got a, a limited number of moving parts, which is what you want if you're trying to make a gun in a home shop. So I would say stick to gas operated guns, and I think the, the direct gas impingement is a really good option there. 
short stroke gas pistons or even long stroke gas pistons would certainly work as well. Um, yeah, you know, at, you could do an SKS. I have an SKS handmade by a little shop in Vietnam. I'll do a video on that at some point here, but it can be done. Craig, speaking of the SKS, says the SKS rifle is such an amazing shooting rifle and an under and underappreciated in the military surplus market. Could you see it further optimized with aftermarket accessories and becoming quite the pricey collectible in another decade? Yes, absolutely. Um, I agree that fundamentally, if there the reason the SKS is underappreciated is because there are so many of them here because we got massive amounts of surplus SKSs both commercially from China, actually, and then surplus from a lot of Warsaw Pact countries after the fall of the Soviet Union. And when the guns are available for 89 or 99 bucks or even less, people don't tend to get, pay them much respect. And if you do want one, well, you know, there's just that, like, it's that Romanian junk or that Chinese junk or that Yugoslav junk, and you can always get one later, you know, they're not, how can they possibly be interesting if they're that readily available? And that cheap. And once those guns dry up, they absolutely will become more valuable and people will start to recognize that, hey, you know, this is actually a totally legitimate widespread military Cold War, like a true military firearm. Because those SKSs were never full auto, the SKSs we have in this country are, generally speaking, completely original military manufacture, unless they're commercial production guns. But you compare that to most of the other guns of the Cold War, FALs, G3s, AKs, all of those things, generally speaking, the best you can get as an individual collector without getting into the machine gun market or a tremendous amount of money, the best you can get are parts kits with American-made receivers. An SKS isn't that. An SKS is it that you have is exactly what came out of that factory and what was issued to that military. And that's something that a lot of people, I think, don't recognize or don't really care about when the guns are cheap. Um, look at how people treat like an actual FN production foul or an actual HK production G3 instead of one with a Century receiver or a PTR receiver or, you know, any of the various AK receivers made in the US. Um, it will take a while for them to go up in value, and of course the rarest ones will go up first. So you can see a little bit of that. Albanian SKSs are worth a premium. East German, North Korean, and North Vietnamese SKSs are worth a substantial premium because those never came in in any sort of quantity, um, never mass commercially imported. But yeah, over time those will go up. Now as for the SKS being like improved and modernized, nah, not really. Uh, Carl and I still have plans to do that over on InRange. Um, that's part of a cool project that we're both really interested in but just haven't had the opportunity to, to follow up on yet, but I promise that sooner or later we will. Um, and we'll take a look at what can you do with an SKS to make it into a more modernized firearm today uh, with the aftermarket parts that are still around. Per, per, P-E-R, um, had a number of questions of which I'm going to pick one here to answer. With all of the idiotic wonder weapons Hitler commissioned or had designed, has there ever been a small arms equivalent of some supposedly tide-turning concept that turned out to be completely worthless or just plain doomed from the start? Like the mouse, the heavy Gustav, or the V2 rocket. The Pedersen device never saw service, and that's the only one I can think of. This is, people aren't going to maybe like this, but I would say the FG42 fits that pretty well. The amount of, the, the resources that were put into developing and producing the FG-42 are completely out of relation to the impact it had on the war. Which I think is the core of, of what you're getting at in the question here. Um, you know, where did they spend time and money and effort that could have been far better utilized on a more practical thing? Well, the gun they came up with, the FG-42, is awesome, and kind of in the same way that the V-2 was a major stepping stone for post-war rocket development and ultimately space exploration, but that doesn't mean it was the right thing that they should have been doing during the war. Um, by the time the FG-42 was put into production, the 8mm Kurtz cartridge was a known thing, um, and the idea of having this really specialized rifle for paratroops that was only going to be used in some pretty limited circumstances doesn't make logistical sense. Like, the paratroops should have stuck with MG-34s or 42s in drop canisters, 
and Sturmgewehrs as their personal weapons. That would have made a lot more sense. Um, you would have been able to you know, take all the money that went into the FG42 design process and put it to better use somewhere else. The downside to that is we wouldn't have gotten the FG42, which is a truly awesome and really cool gun. But as I think I've said occasionally before, and is becoming more and more apparent to me, there is often the, the practicality of a gun and the coolness of a gun are often uh, inversely proportional. Like the cooler it is, the less likely that it's going to be a really good practical gun. The FG42 runs really well, but mm, not, not the wisest thing for them to have been spending money on. Greg says, I know you've been asked and have answered about the Lage uh, M11-15, which is an adapter, it, well it's a replacement upper for the uh, the Mac 10, Mac 11, M11-9 submachine guns to turn them into open bolt locked breech 556 guns, and it's super awesome, and I'm on the waiting list. Uh, in fact, I discovered I'm actually number one on the waiting list for the version of that that will fit my Mac. I'm really excited about it. But uh, Greg's question is, have you heard of the Tenko upper, Tenko upper for the Mac series recently announced on Uzi Talk, and what are your thoughts on it? Um, I have heard bits and pieces about it. Um, after getting this question I went and did a little more poking. It is interesting. Um, it is only being developed at this point for the M10, which is the 45 caliber Mac, which makes it less interesting to me because I don't have one of those. I am also, like, if I right now had to put a bet on, like, you can only, you can only pursue one of these developments, which one do you want it to be? It would have to be the Lage, because Richard Lage has a tremendous track record of making products that are good and work, and his customer support is excellent. And these other guys, this is their first thing. Now I don't know what experience the, the designers, the, the people involved have personally before, but the company exists only to do this conversion of the Mac 10. So I'm putting my money, literally and figuratively, on Lage, because he's got the track record to justify it for me. Now if Tenko comes out with a cool one for the M10, great. In fact what I see online is that they're working on 762x39, and apparently it looks like they're also working on an adapter that would allow you to fit an unmodified AR upper to an unmodified Mac 10 lower. It looks kind of ugly and kludgy, like there's a lot of length of pull in this thing because everything's spaced out way more than all the parts were originally designed for, but that's pretty cool. Um, we'll have to wait and see. They're being a little more tight-lipped about it than Lage is. I suspect they're not quite so far along in the development process. They've got some prototypes, you can see video of them on YouTube shooting, it's uh, T-E-N-K-O. Um, so I, I got nothing against them. I would love to get a chance to tinker with one once they're finished and ready, um, but it's not going to apply to me directly because the Mac that I have is an M11A1, and I got that specifically to get one of the Lage uppers. And by the way, as soon as those are out, which hopefully will be something like summer of 2019, I'll be very excited to do some video and some shooting. I'm really looking forward to that. Anthony says, what historical firearm do you think is the most overrated today due to its representation or inclusion in pop culture, video games, movies, TV shows, etc? My initial answer is the Walther WA-2000. Um, that was a, an adequate gun in the 70s, <laughs> 70s and maybe 80s. Um, it was accurate. It was okay. It was far too expensive. It was mechanically fairly complex. It was ex complex to make. Um, and because of its scarcity and its inclusion in pop culture stuff, it's become a completely mythologized gun. And in practice, eh, it's okay. But like you can get a lot of things today that shoot every bit as well, if not better, than a Walther 2000, and do it for a tiny fraction of the price. In general, you tend to get guns that are both uh, have reputations that are both too good and too poor as a result of pop culture inclusions, because Ultimately, pop culture does not reflect the realities of any firearm, and I'm sure this applies to everything else. Vehicles, any other sort of prop element that goes into TV or video game or movies. Like, they're there to do whatever the script says. Video games in particular, 
they bear no relation to a real gun. I hope people realize that. Like, maybe the animation is the same as how a real gun looks, but ultimately it's not a gun. It's just a collection of electronic bits that do numbers, and that's not the same thing. So, um, the, the list, basically every gun is incorrectly portrayed in pop culture because the point of pop culture is not to accurately portray the gun. Wesley says, is trigger discipline a recent development? Were t troops taught to have trigger discipline with fingers straight off the trigger until ready to fire in world wars and before? No, trigger discipline is absolutely a relatively recent phenomenon. You can see that by looking at pictures of soldiers all over the place. Um, and not just soldiers, but just regular civilian shooters. It is freakishly common to find guys with, and girls, with fingers wrapped around the trigger. Um, muzzle discipline not quite as bad, but also not good. Um, that really is a fairly recent development, and I think it's an aspect of the, it's something that people don't necessarily give, we don't give ourselves due credit for. Firearm safety, in terms of actually, you know, I blam, I accidentally shot that thing. Um, firearm safety in that way has made tremendous improvements. Um, there are a tiny number of actual, legitimately accidental shootings today, and that has been a very deliberate effort by a lot of gun safety groups. I won't mention names because some of them are very politically touchy, but you know what? There's a lot of, a lot of people will fixate on the political motivation of a group that's involved in firearms and overlook the fact that they may also do a lot of work in gun safety, and that gun safety work has had fantastic, very positive outcomes. Um, hunter safety, you know, accidental shootings, all that sort of stuff is down a lot. And it's really cool, and you can see this in large part by looking at photographs of the past, when people are wandering around with fingers on triggers and waving guns around in what we would today consider nauseatingly unsafe ways. Uh, in fact, before I move on, the one other interesting application of this that I've seen is um, relating to reenactors. You get guys today, especially guys who have real shooting backgrounds, who get into reenacting, and they'll tend to hold rifles in this, you know, low ready you have the, the butt in your shoulder and holding the gun pointed at the ground in a safe direction. And that's not historically accurate. If you want to recreate the way soldiers actually walked around with guns, say in World War II, it was often horizontal, finger over the trigger and holding the gun across, you know, across the waist, walking around with it like this. And again, what today we would consider to be tremendously unsafe, because half the time they're pointing it at the guys next to them. That's just how it was done. That's what people did back then. One more page here. Whew, see if we can finish these all before my voice gives out. Chris says, I wondered what is your background in firearms to have such an impressive knowledge of them? First off, thank you. Brings up an interesting point. What is a background in firearms? Because there is no, like, you can't go to college and get a degree in, in like gun history or firearms mechanics. You could go to a gunsmithing school for sure, but not really quite the same thing. So my background is, quite literally, I've spent about 10 years professionally doing it. That's about how long I've been running Forgotten Weapons. It started as just a website and then evolved into a video channel. And by having that as, at first, um, a hobby, um, a passion of mine, and then turning into a full-time job, that gives me the opportunity to spend a lot of time hands-on with a lot of guns, gives me a lot of opportunity to do research. Um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge in a library like this, and and that's a huge boon um, to me, to be able to access uh, the work of other researchers. So um, if you were to go to someone and say, what is your background in this thing that you have done professionally for 10 years? The answer is usually, I got a college degree which kind of didn't have anything to do with what I actually do today, and then I have 10 years of experience doing it. Um, that is, that is my background, is I've been very consciously doing it this long with an eye towards being as accurate and as correct as I can be. Uh, Dina says, congratulations on being a step closer to publishing your book. Thank you. Um, it is, by the way, being peer-reviewed right now. So the, the, the initial draft of the manuscript is done, which is very exciting. 
Um, since you now have the French Firearms book coming soon, and the AK Guide already published, that would be the Vickers Guide, Volume 1 on the Kalashnikov, which actually has my name on the cover, which is super cool. Uh, I was wondering, what advice would you give to an aspiring firearms author such as myself? Uh, it will take longer than you expect. You do not know as much as you think you do when you go into the process of writing. That's, that's probably the biggest single thing that I discovered writing a book on French military rifles, is you can have a subject and think, wow, you know, I know all about this stuff, I'm, I'm pretty hot stuff, like I'm an expert. And then when you try to write it down, that's when you discover every little hole in your knowledge, because you'll be writing down like, ah, here's the story of Gun X, and you get to a point and you're like, oh wait, when they made this variation, why did they do that? I never really thought about that. Why did they do that? I have to go find that out. And then you keep moving down, and, and then you'll be like, well, they, you know, in 1910 they had this, in 1920 they had this, and it's different. Like, what changed, and why, and when? And, oh, I don't know. I have to go find out. So the, at the end of writing a book, you are a far better, you, you know far more on the subject than you did when you started, which for me, and hopefully for you as well, was one of the really cool parts of doing that writing. Like, I find this topic genuinely fascinating, and that's why I was writing the book in the first place, is because I liked the subject matter, and to discover that I will come out of the process knowing even more about it, like a lot more about it than I did going in, that's really cool. That's like a side benefit. For a lot of people, I think, if you understand that effect, I think a lot of people would be willing to write a book for no money, like not expecting to ever sell a copy, but to write a book simply to learn as much as you know you will learn in that process. Duncan asks, what is your opinion on the viability of sidearms in modern combat and the US Army's replacement of their M9 with the P320? I don't think it matters. Um, I think handguns are basically never used in a combat situation, not on any sort of reasonable scale. Yeah, I know someone's going to point out this incident and that event where they were, you know, saved a, an entire division with a pistol. But in the grand scheme of things, you have to have pistols for a number of reasons, but it is very rare that they are actually used. And so as long as one's military does not adopt a gun that is a complete death trap, it really doesn't matter. That's why what you see in the, the procurement trials is not really about, like, what's the best competition gun. You know, they're not adopting some IPSC refined red dot equipped uber blaster. They're adopting a gun largely on logistics. Like, how much does the gun cost? How much does the ammo cost? What about holsters and training? And how long do the parts last? Because you know, we know we're going to have to replace a bunch of these parts, so we have to factor that into our decision, and ultimately they want a gun that's going to be good enough and cost as little as possible, because that's that's really what you need out of a handgun in a military context. Josie says, did John Moses Browning have any notable firearms ideas or mechanical concepts which didn't pan out or were outright failures? We're familiar with a seemingly endless list of his successes with handguns, rifles, shotguns, and machine guns, so it seems like he hit a home run every time. Is this true, or were there some bumps in the road? Yes, there were actually a lot of bumps in the road for him. <clears throat> um, part of the reason that he looks so successful is, first off, he was extremely successful, and perhaps the, the most successful, most brilliant firearms designer we've ever had on this planet. Uh, because of that success, Winchester really wanted everything that came out of his brain, and so they made a deal that they, until a certain point when it fell apart, they bought every patent he came up with. And then it was up to Winchester to determine what they could do with that patent. So yes, a lot of them were turned into very successful firearms, but a lot of them also went nowhere. Like, we'll buy this patent. This one, this looks like crap, or you know, it's some widget that we can never make commercially successful. But we want to make sure that the next patent he comes up with, we get first crack at, because it might be the next Auto 5, or the next, you know, the next lever action, the next Winchester 1895, or any one of his other fantastically successful guns. So we'll buy everything. If it's not good, fine. We just write off that cost and we're willing to accept it, and we'll sit on that patent because it's worthless. Um, a good example of that would be. If you're familiar with the Colt Potato Digger machine gun that he designed that has this gas lever that swings, well he patented a pistol working the same way that had this little gas lever on top of the slide. Well it didn't have a slide because it had this gas lever. That is a not 
successful gun. I don't think they ever even made a prototype of it. But that, per that patent got purchased up because they wanted to make sure that they continued to get or get Browning's other ideas. So yeah, he invented a lot of stuff that didn't go anywhere. Um, by no means was he 100% successful. Uh, Traveston says, Ian, it seems that countries like Germany and Japan resorted to last-ditch weapons that functioned essentially the same and just as effectively as the well-finished iterations early in the war. Very perceptive. Knowing that they were outnumbered and needed to equip as many troops in as little time and material as they could from the beginning, why would they not have started out with not caring about the finish or the details as much and focus only on making the weapons function well? Largely because a lot of these guns are actually made and adopted and procured in peacetime. And it just kind of goes against human nature to deliberately adopt a crummy looking cheap gun. Um, you know, look at it today. There's a lot of simplification that we could do on US military rifles. If you take an M16 and go, okay, let's say there's been five years of strategic bombing and we need to make a million of these as cheaply as possible, what could we simplify? Like, let's take the collapsing stock on an M4 and just make it not collapse. Like, they can just deal with it. And we could look back on that historically and say, you know, the collapsing stock wasn't that big a deal certainly didn't justify the extra cost, so let's leave it off. Um, simplify the handguards, uh, simplify the rear sights, give them fixed sights. Um, but the, the procurement realities of peacetime prevent that from ever happening, because there'd be an outrage. Like, why are you equipping our troops with these deliberately, uh, you know, subpar guns? They look like crap. You know, they don't even have an upper handguard to protect your hand, regardless of whether that's actually all that important or not. So it's one of those things where it just doesn't really sink in until it's too late. And also you have an issue of this is industrial production, and to a certain extent it's cheaper, it, like your production stays higher by continuing to do what you already have in process. Just changing the process is going to put the production line out of commission for some period of time. And let's say you're making 100,000 rifles a month, do you really can you afford to have zero rifles for a month while you're retooling the whole thing to make a simpler one, even if you know you'll get 150,000 a month after that? Well, what month do you choose to have zero? You know, if if you're in the middle of a war, there's never a good month. You're not you can't see into the future and be like, ah, well, we know that three months from now we'll have a lull in you know in this offensive drive and we can put off rifle production then. You never know. It's always gonna look kind of like this is the most important time and we need the most production right now. So these changes have to be phased in and they don't happen as quickly as, as you might expect. Kurosawa uh, says, rail guns versus coil guns in a futuristic, as a futuristic rifle. I'm writing a TV pilot in which the future militaries use such weapons as standard issue. I was wondering what the pros and cons of each concept might be. Honestly, I have no idea. It's not something I've spent any time really thinking about until such time as we have the energy storage to make either of those concepts even remotely feasible. It's just sci-fi. So interesting in concept, but not something that I've ever really looked into. Uh, Richard says, in your research have you found any instances of soldiers bringing their own personal pistols into combat, particularly World War I? I know pistols were mostly signs of rank, but I would imagine that if a soldier could fit a small pocket 32 or revolver in their uniform, they would have brought theirs along for backup or close quarters. At least I know I would have. Yes, um, actually not that uncommon, especially among cultures like the US, where firearms ownership was pretty common. Uh, on the one hand, for example, uh, in World War I, British officers were simply required and expected to provide their own handguns. So every officer's pistol in World War I in the British military was a personal pistol, and you could buy whatever model you wanted with the caveat that they had to use the standard service ammunition. The army would issue you ammo for your personal gun. So whether it was a Webley Mark VI or a Webley WG or any you know, a Webley Fosbury, whatever you wanted to get, if it was 455 Webley, that's, that's cool. Um, you're an officer, you're supposed to be a big boy, and you're supposed to have access to that sort of thing, and you'll provide it yourself. Um, as far as like the the infantry, the you know the privates on the line, yeah, um, I've read a number of accounts of American soldiers, World War One and also World War II, who would do things like you know write home and ask 
opt to send them a revolver, or maybe just have it sent without specifically being asked for. You know, hey, we here's a we got this thirty eight. We figured you might want something for your foxhole in case you know a Japanese soldier on a bonsai charge jumps into your foxhole, or in case you know the Germans overrun the line. You're not issued a pistol, so here we have mailed you your thirty eight or whatever else might be at hand. Now that's tempered by the fact that handguns were pretty expensive. Um, more expensive uh, in context back then than they are today, relative to people's income. Um, especially a lot of the people who were conscripted or volunteer privates in the infantry. But yeah, it absolutely happened. You probably, you know, it, if you were someone who would normally be issued a pistol, that's less likely to happen if you're a tank crewman or a, an aircraft crewman. But if you didn't have a pistol issued, not that uncommon to provide one for yourself. Um, you will see the same thing with the German officers in World War I. There was a lot of use of a wide variety of pistols, which makes it kind of interesting and difficult to study German handguns during World War I because there was such a variety. So yeah, definitely happened. Um, let's see, Adam. There's a lot of info out there about the Labelle being the first smokeless powder military rifle, but what was the first smokeless powder uh, pistol? What kind of impact did it have on the evolution of pistol making and use? Um, actually, I have a video. The first smokeless powder pistol, basically, I think it's just simpler to say what was the first semi-auto pistol, because the major impact of smokeless powder on handguns was making semi-auto handguns a feasible thing. Um, black, there were black powder, obviously black powder revolvers. That's not that big of a problem because you don't really have a mechanism that you have to that's going to get fouled up with black powder that quickly and stop working. Uh, there were some manually operated repeating pistols like the Volcanic and a bunch of weird cool Austrian designs with black powder, but it wasn't until we had smokeless powder that semi-auto pistols really became available. And the first one of those was the Salvatore Dormus, and I have an entire video, actually I have a video on the Salvatore Dormus, and I have a whole video on specifically what were the very first semi-auto pistols. Next up is uh, Will. I love that you include your dog in videos. You've actually pushed me over the edge into letting my daughters get a red healer last year, and it has been wonderful. Can you please share some details about your dog and their story, her story, uh, Dharma? Uh, very cool I, that you got a red healer. Um, there are red and blue healers. They are also known as Australian cattle dogs. They have a tremendous amount of energy, and they're actually remarkably long-lived dogs. Um, for what that's worth. The reason that we have one is because uh, a co-worker of my wife's six years ago now, or seven years ago, had a pair of uh, red healer puppies show up on his front door. Like, he opened the door to go to work one day and there was this pair of puppies that had been abandoned by someone. Probably not abandoned on his front door, but you know, roam free little puppies, which is something that only <clears throat> unfavorable people do, because what that means is they're going to die of starvation, or out here in the desert they're going to die of thirst. Well these two found their way to this co-worker's front door, and uh, he put out water and food for them hoping they'd go away, which yeah, you know how likely that is. So he got back that evening and they're very happily right there still. So he started looking around at, uh, at their place of employment for someone who might be interested, and my wife expressed a potential interest, like, well we'll look. And uh, one of them had already been adopted at that point. So Dharma, the other puppy, was brought in uh, into our living room, and you know, this little tiny fuzzball of a puppy, and walked the perimeter of the living room, kind of sniffing things, and then came right back to my wife, looked up at her right in the eyes, and then curled up on her foot and went to sleep. And so now we have a dog. Uh, Wahoo says, did any FG-42 Type 1s make it back into the US as transferable functional guns? Yes. Not a lot. Probably less than a dozen, but there are some on the registry. So they are out there. Save your pennies. Uh, Jesse says, between Forgotten Weapons and CN Arsenal I have found some of the most interesting content to be concerning handguns that have unique designed actions, especially with regard to early semi-auto pistols. I agree completely. Uh, do you have any recommendations for good books that delve into the history and design concepts and functions of pistols from this era? Yes, I do, and I like taking every opportunity I get to plug this book because 
it is a great book. Handguns of the World by Edward Ezell. Uh, Mr. Ezell is a very noted firearms expert and author, unfortunately deceased now. Um, but he wrote this rather huge book. I have a whole specific book review on this. This is 700 pages long. It is indexed. And it is um, comprehensive, they call it, a comprehensive international guide to military revolvers and self-loaders. And that's exactly what it is, going up to about World War II. And it covers both the commonplace guns that did get adopted and all sorts of weird stuff. All the sorts of guns that you see on Forgotten Weapons are covered in here. It's an awesome book. It is not quite as cheap as it used to be. When I first started talking about that you could get a copy on Amazon for like five bucks, plus five bucks shipping. It's more expensive than that now, but this was published by Barnes & Noble. This was not some little niche, uh, you know, boutique press book. This was intended to be, you know, mass market and widely available, and so they're still out there and readily available. And I strongly recommend that book. If you can only have one book on pistols, that is absolutely the one that I would, I would suggest to you. Uh, a different Jesse, I believe, um, ha is asking this question a second time, so I try to answer stuff when it gets asked repeatedly. If I don't do it the first or second time I let tell me, keep submitting it, I try to get to them. Um, charger clips versus Mauser clips and why? Did any country use Mausers with charger clips? Charger clips meaning like K31 and Vetterli Vitali style clips. Um, that is a clip that doesn't just hold the rim of the cartridge like a, a traditional Mauser stripper clip, but actually kind of encapsulates the whole thing and supports the case head and the bullet. Uh, the two notable ones that do this are the, the Swedish or the Swiss K31s and Schmidt Rubens uh, and the Vetterli Vitali. No, no, not really. Nobody else really used those. There were a few experiments with semi-auto rifles like the FAL um, to use sort of the same style of clip. They wanted to do a 10 round clip and in order to make in order to support that, like to keep the rounds in line so that you could easily load them, it was kind of a horseshoe shaped thing that supported the front as well. But in general what people found is you didn't need the extra support on a five round clip. A, a regular stripper clip worked just fine. They were a lot less bulky, they were cheaper, they were easier. There's no need to have this full on charger clip. Um, interesting that the Swiss actually made those basically disposable because their chargers were made out of like compressed cardboard. And our last question for today, whew, the end of three pages, is from Stephen. says, I was thinking for precision or long range shooting would it make more sense to have a trigger that would fire the rifle on release instead of pull? This is something that was actually done for a while with shotguns, um, uh, sporting shotguns, uh, release triggers, where when you're ready to fire you pull the trigger and nothing happens, and when you release it that's when the gun fires. There are a couple of basic safety problems with those, which is why they're not really seen in shotgun use anymore. Namely, once you pull that trigger, like some, it's gonna fire somewhere. If you have a regular trigger and you know you've got your finger on the trigger and you're on target and you decide not to fire, just take your finger off the trigger and nothing happens. With a release trigger, you tend to pull the trigger. And then you're tracking your target waiting for just the right moment to release it, because you have to pull it first. And then what happens if you decide you don't want to take the shot? Now you're stuck here with this thing that's going to go off, it's like a dead man switch now in your hand. And there may be ways to mitigate that, like engage the safety and then release the trigger. But um, ultimately when it's so... the only time this would really be an advantage is when you have to have a very very crisp, very light trigger, or when you get the most benefit from that. And you know, we can do that with a regular press trigger. And I think physiologically, yeah, it, it sounds like it makes sense in the context of something like a Nagant revolver with this really long heavy trigger pull. Well, what if you could pull that whole thing through and then when you release it then it fires? But you don't have to have a long and heavy trigger pull, especially for a competition or a target or a sniper's rifle. You just have a very crisp, light trigger. And it works just as well without having the additional the safety issues um, sitting out there waiting to eventually cause a problem for someone. So that is all the questions that we have time for today. Uh, thank you to everyone who submitted a question. I got I think about 300 questions for this Q&A, which is about 12 times as many as I can actually have time and voice. I'm 
my voice is starting to go here, uh, far more than I have time to answer. So if you think you had a darn good question and I didn't answer it this time, please do submit it next month. Um, and I will do my best to, to address it. There were several in here that were repeat questions. Uh, if you want to get in on this and you haven't uh, been able to in the past, this is for folks who are on Patreon at the $2 a month and up level. And uh, I will say thank you to all of you, and now I need to go answer my phone because I forgot to turn it off before I started recording. Thanks for watching.